Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hey, supply chain and logistics people. This is Joe Lynch with the Logistics of Logistics podcast. Today's topic is five keys to cold chain success with my buddy, Tyler Hildebrandt. Say hello, Tyler. Hello, Joe. Thank you so much for joining me today, Tyler. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. I met Tyler a few months ago and we've become fast friends. He's I think you'll see throughout this interview that he's a very interesting guy, multi-talented. So uh, I don't know about that, but yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> so Tyler, please introduce yourself. Yes, I am an account executive at Reliable Transportation Solutions. We are an asset-based 3PL here in Cincinnati. We also have a brokerage wing and account executive is sort of a sexier word for broker. <laughs> and I think, I, I think, Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm the first broker you've had on the podcast. Does that sound right? Maybe. I mean, we all sell transportation services one way or another. And you were a broker. Yeah, you were a, you, you, you were slinging freight at one point. Weren't oh, you? yeah, absolutely. I guess, right, guess right. it always will be. <laughs> so, right, right. so Tyler has a very interesting background. Tyler, take us a little bit through your background. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? What was your major in college? All that kind of stuff. Well, I grew up here in Cincinnati, Ohio. I actually went to a college down in Sarasota, Florida, and my major was illustration. The college is called Ringling School of Art and Design, and I picked it because it was by the beach, and I picked illustration because I didn't want to do math. So those are two uh, not great reasons to pick a career in a college. <laughs> it's a nice it area, out. though. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. I go there once a, once a year, yep. So you've had, a, you've had a very interesting career path from studying to be an illustrator to being on my yep. podcast talking about cold chain. So tell us a little bit about your career right. before we get into the meat of the topic today. Sure. My first job ever was I was 15 years old and it's Coney Island here in Cincinnati. And I was working in the warehouse there and actually drawing portraits. So not caricatures, but actual portraits. So You know, so those were kind of my two weird introductions to what my careers would turn out to be. So and throughout my life, as a second job, I would always work in warehouses and and some of them had cold storage units and those kind of things. So that was a that was sort of a foundation of what I'm doing today. But I always did art. I always sort of loved it. And then when, as I said, when college came around, that was that was my main reason for picking it. But I ended up owning an art gallery for five years right out of college, where I did a lot of work for um, University of Notre Dame, Chicago Cubs, some major construction companies here in Cincinnati, and then actually kind of sort of evolved into becoming a professor at a college here in Cincinnati and worked my way up into the administrative levels where I was managing business aspects and doing a lot of sales, fundraising and enrollment and all that kind of stuff. There was a certain point where they were looking for a president and I uh, happened to be their internal candidate, which was flattering. I don't know if I would have been a good president by any means. But at that point, I had done a lot of consulting for marketing and, and things like that, which is what art kind of can translate to is marketing and creative thinking and branding and those kind of things. And some of the guys I was working with were in logistics, in the logistics field. So I was helping them market and brand themselves and tell their story and separate themselves. So I had got a a good understanding of what they did. And it was very interesting. So when the opportunity as a candidate for the president came along, I really got to thinking about it. And I thought about the last 10 years of the college and there was, uh, I think, five presidents and they all got fired and one actually had killed himself. So I said, maybe I should uh, <laughs> think about think about this logistics thing. Maybe and logistics said, isn't going, so yeah. bad. <laughs> right. Maybe logistics is, you know, there's a lot, to, there's a lot to be said about logistics. These guys were, they were doing very well. They were hard workers. And it was the, the more, the part of, part of that consulting was doing a lot of research for them on behalf of them because they were busy and doing their own thing. So I got very familiar with it. And I told the, the college, I said, um, thank you very much. I appreciate it, but I'm going to do logistics. And they were like, what the hell are you talking about? What is that? I mean, what, what are you doing? You know, it's just about as far away from art and, uh, you know, different creative things as you can get, maybe. But as we were talking earlier, 
there's a lot of, you know, if you're, if you're thinking creatively in this field, there's a, there's a lot of room. I mean, there's a lot of creative things going on. You know what I mean? And you just have to frame it that way and think about it in sort of a creative problem solving situation. Absolutely. And I think that we are all hustling all the time, run, run, run. And it is sometimes hard to have that original thought, sometimes hard to have, you know, a a creative approach to something. I mean, we all do it. It's, it's human nature, but uh, someone like you, who's got, you know, been uh, an artist, an academic, and now, uh, now been selling logistics services. I think you have a unique perspective. So today's topic is five keys to cold chain success. And uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to me. I've, I've probably did 40 different training webinars on it over the last mm-hmm. few years. And especially with the food safety modernization act. And so I always like to give the basics before we get into it. So Tyler, give us a little bit about the basics of the cold chain. What is it? Right. And, uh, you know, I think you are an expert and I don't consider myself necessarily an expert. You know, you, you're the man, but I, you know, I do have different perspectives from, you know, I think as a broker and as working in different warehouses and and things like that, you know, there's different things that can kind of add up. And I think cold chain really is, I mean, if it's, if it's not the most important part of our global economy, I'm not, I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? I, I mean, it's, it's incredibly important. It's, it's a temperature controlled supply chain for perishable food products. It could be pharmaceuticals, chemicals, could also be blood and biopsies and different sort of medical necessities. And it increases their shelf life. And, it, you know, one of the things that when I started cutting my teeth in this business, I, RTS really specializes in food transportation and, and those kind of things. I said, why are you guys messing around with it? You know, I mean, what, why don't you just, why don't you move something a lot, a lot less involved? And they said, you know, food is something that is always going to be shipped. It's not going you know, away. And, and <laughs> it's not going away. People need to eat. There's a sense of urgency and there is a really stringent process in managing it from point A to point B. And most, most of the time, it's from a business perspective as a broker, the commodity is of higher value. So um, there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah, so, yeah. Tyler, if I, if I could add something is uh, also when we talk about cold chain, we're talking about moving food. You know, we, we are as consumers much pickier than we were a generation ago. I always think when oh, yeah. I'm in my 50s, you know, we ate Kraft macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and no one thought that was child abuse. <laughs> now, uh, right. now I look at what my daughters eat. It's uh, vegan and organic. And, you know, if you went to a restaurant 10, 15 years ago and said, what is your vegan menu or what's your, you know, is that organic or was that chicken raised in a friendly, happy environment? They would just look right. at you with a blank stare. <laughs> now, now, and so we've upgraded, uh, the consumer expectations have upgraded. And I was just, we were talking about this before we got on Mm-hmm. online here we uh we're talking about how many things we put in the refrigerator when in doubt we put it in the refrigerator like jam and jelly it used to just be in the cupboard not, yeah. not anymore it's in the refrigerator so right. it, it's it's right. the cold chain is is probably more important now than it was even 10 or 15 years ago even though we still had refrigeration back then so you're right i mean you know and when my wife now i mean that's right she, she she is so picky about every little thing, which she wants to know where it came from. She wants, you know, I'll eat anything. I'll eat a bologna sandwich off the floor, you know. <laughs> but when she put, when she gives me a, a grocery list, I'm spending three or four hours trying to find all these little things. I think that's, that's really kind of the culture that we're in right now. And uh, my younger siblings who are millennials, I mean, that's, you know, there are certain things that, that they eat, they won't eat. They know where it came from. They know who did it. You know, I, you know, I. That's important, you know. I mean, that's that's important. To them. I remember a few years back, I was at the grocery store with my uh, my daughter, and she's uh, had her smartphone, and mm-hmm. she put it over. She was trying to scan. I don't know. She tried didn't know whether she could scan the barcode on a package of blueberries. And I said, right. "What are you doing with that?" And she said, "Can I see where these blueberries are from?" And I said, "No, that's just to check no. out." But it, it's funny. I thought. You know what? We're not that far from there. We're not so far from people wanting to know where was that food picked and, you know, what was the process to get it here? What day would it is picked? You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah Joe, I, I don't think that I don't think that's that far from reality. You know, I mean, I, I think that's probably something we can expect sometime in the future. Yep. Absolutely. So very closely tied to cold chain is the Food Safety Modernization Act and, and the FDA compliance in general. So 
tell, I know we can't spend a lot of time on it, but tell us the basics right. of the Food Safety Modernization Act. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that could be certainly be its own two hour podcast. There's a lot of information there. So let's just go over kind of the basics. But a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today in these five points are um, sort of based around this act. And it was the biggest overhaul of Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, in history. Signed into law January 4th, 2011, which ensures safety and security of the food and feed supply to protect human and animal health. It's a significant impact to the food supply chain. I mean, it had a, had a really big impact. Especially, you know, there's, and there was a lot of people that were, a lot of companies that were already doing this, but the ones that weren't had to figure it out pretty quick or they were going to be in some problems. And it applies to food transport in bulk where the food touches the walls of the vehicle, you know, particularly juices. Packaged foods, not fully enclosed, so fresh produce, different things like that. And temperature control, safety for different meats, fresh meats, frozen meats, beef, chicken, and those kind of things. So, you know. It's a pretty big act. And I I will say this also, Tyler, is that this hadn't been, the FDA hadn't had any significant change, uh, significant overhauls, we'll call it. And this really moved them from an inspection mindset where we're going to inspect final product to a process mindset, which is the same as most of industry had. If you're a manufacturer, you used to inspect products at the end. Then they said, no, that doesn't yeah. work because we. what are you going to do with it? It's already made. So now they don't inspect as much at the end. The focus is now on let's improve the process. And when right. you say we're going to improve the process, there's a lot of processes to address when we're a talking about the cold chain. Because really, when you we're, we're talking about the cold chain here, we're talking about basically farm to fork. And there's a lot of different companies, a lot of different hands touching. The, oh, ideally not hands touching, but a lot of different, a lot of different companies involved in the process. So to that end, tell us a little bit about the cold chain infrastructure. Yeah, Joe, I think so what you said, it starts in the field and ends at the consumer. And that goes for everything. It doesn't matter if it's produce or if it's beef or chicken. It's starting somewhere and it goes through a process to get to us at the grocery store. So let's say, you know, this week is the 4th of July week. You're up at a picnic in Minnesota eating grapes. So those grapes, chances are they might have been picked in Southern California a couple days ago. They were picked in the field where they were moved to um, a pre-cooling facility on site because they have to pre-cool to slow down ripening and reduce spoilage. A lot of times, majority of times, there's a refrigerated cold storage, and that could be a like a walk-in cooler, depending, you know, could be a major cold storage distribution center. Somewhere in there, this, these items are going to be packaged, which is something that logistics guys like me probably don't think about a lot, but shippers you know, think about it quite a bit. And there's a lot of new kinds of packaging and technology that can go into that that, that uh, makes that a lot more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And then at some point, these grapes are going to be put on a truck. So that's where I come in. So uh, refrigerated transportation. So it's gonna, you're going to get a reefer, take it from point A to point B. It has to be at a certain temperature. So let's say it's grapes. It's probably going to be around 36, 36 temp. And a lot of times if it's grapes, it might go directly from the pre-cooling facility to the truck. There's sort of a, a shorter span there. And then it's going to get from Southern California to um, Minneapolis, Minnesota in two days. You're going to be eating it the next day. You know, and a lot of things that we don't think about as well that aren't, you know, physical part of the cold chain infrastructure, but information management systems, right? Oh, yeah. Tyler, good point. I mean, obviously, you know, those of us who are in the transportation logistics business, we kind of tend to look in our own little piece of the pie. But there is the pre-cooling facilities, right? And and that's to make sure that, you know, when you pick that grape, it's probably 95 degrees, just like it is outside outside. You have to quickly cool it. That's what the pre-cooling facilities do. It's going to be stored somewhere along the way, whether in California or somewhere along the way, it's going to be transported. And packaging, again, it's got to be thermal. It's got to be insulated. That has a big impact on how quickly that fruit spoils. So, And then you started to talk a little bit about the information management systems. Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, Yeah, I mean, those are the things that are not a physical part of the infrastructure, but stuff that we a very, very important part of this of the cold chain. Route optimization, WMS, TMS documentation, all the hardware and the scanning equipment and the phone apps that we use, business intelligence and KPIs. And most importantly, I think is the real time monitoring, you know, the the things that the sensors that alert us for non-compliance, especially in the trucks and the warehouses, those kind of things. Those are the things that I, I utilize, you know, on a daily basis all day long. 
Absolutely. Tyler, I know when we were offline, you were telling me about the trucks now, a lot of the trucks that you guys are using, that when the temperature starts to go too high or basically become out of range, starts moving in the wrong direction, it alerts not only that the driver gets an alert and also a dispatch gets alert. So that's that's a that's yeah. a new innovation. 20 years ago, you might have gotten there and go, oh, mm-hmm. it turns out my trailer uh, trailer got too warm. Hope nobody notices. Now we're noticing we're getting alerts, real time alerts. And that's where we need them. You need that. That driver needs to know. Now's the time to pull over, not later on go, ah, oh, damn, I ruined another one. And that, and that happens. You know what I mean? That stuff happens. And so when, when you get that alert, there's a lot greater chance of you to act fast and fix the situation. I mean, it's a, it's a thing that you, that you have to deal with all the time. And part of that is communication that we're going to talk about later. But, you know, I think in, in this whole process here from point A to point B that we talked about with the grapes, there's, it's, and that's something I'm saying from Southern California, Minneapolis, because that's a real lane that, you know, we run pretty often. And there's so many, it's so down, so down to the minute sometimes. You know what I mean? Because that truck that's going to pick up the grapes at this that are being pre-cooled right now. So he's in Southern California and he has to pre-cool his own truck because it, it, the grapes won't, they're not going to put the grapes on his truck until they're at a certain, his truck's running at a certain temperature. And when you're thinking of it, it's 110 degrees in Southern California. He's going to have to be planning way ahead of time to pre-cool that so it gets there. And then he's going to have to, he has a certain appointment up in Minnesota where he has to deliver that because maybe the receiver is not open the next day. You know what I mean? And that's a quick run. So there's a lot of things that need to line up in that two-day run from all points, you know, all points on the chain that have to communicate, have to line up just perfectly to get that truck of grapes from point A to point B with no problem so you can eat that on 4th of July. We'll get right back to the podcast in just a moment. If you sell transportation or logistics services, the Logistics of Logistics can help you sell more. Our customized program will help you understand your sales personality, including your strengths and blind spots, get more sales leads, and improve your communication and salesmanship. We can also position you as a recognized industry expert and help you reach your target audience. To learn more, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com. And now, back to the show. Tyler, we've talked about the basics now. We've talked about FSMA. We've talked about why cold chain is important. We talked about it's a lot more than just reefers. It's pre-cooling. It's refrigerated storage. There's the packaging. There's information systems. So that gives us the foundation here. So now let's talk about the five keys to cold chain success. So what is the first key? I would say this is the most important thing. And some of these things we're going to talk about sound sort of basic, but they're not basic. There, there's a lot of things that go into this. But I, I think that number one is creating the right culture. Some people have it. Some people don't. But it's, it's a culture of value in food safety. And if this is your business and this is what you're doing and you don't have the right culture that starts at the top, there can be a lot of problems and there can be financial problems. There can be problems all the way down the line. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. And I think what, when you're talking about that culture, you know, I'm from Detroit and I worked in automotive for a long time. And when the Japanese started to get a, a leg up on us quality wise and manufacturing efficiency, we started adopting all their tools. I mean, that was a big thing. You know, if, what do they do? What's their process? And we did all that. I was involved in benchmarking. And it all made sense. And it was probably 20 years after we started that process. So we probably started that in the 80s. In the 2000s, there was a recognition that one thing we didn't focus enough on was culture. And if you, if you don't have a culture of quality, a culture of let's do things right, then all the tools and all the modern processes and having all the infrastructure to do it right doesn't help if I don't value it. And to your point, the culture starts at the top. You have to you have to value food safety. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think part of these is continuous improvement. So where can we continue to improve? This is sort of a fluid growing thing. I mean, you know, the industry is evolving, involved with the industry. Risk management. What is every possible thing that could go wrong with this product anywhere along the way? Not not something that has gone wrong in the past, but what could go wrong? And you got operation guys that aren't always the most fun to be around. Because this is what they're thinking about every single day. Cost, timing, quality, the chain of custody. Who's going to be in charge of this? Because there's a lot of trust involved. When you've got something that's uh, switching hands along the way, who's going to be responsible for this? 
if a problem goes wrong, what's the resolution for every situation? And then what's the root cause analysis? Yep. I love when you say it's chain of custody. I always <laughs> used to say in the training that I would do is that we've all seen those cop shows where they have the evidence. And when they have that evidence, they always have a chain of custody. So somebody's always responsible for it. So if you check it out of the evidence room, it has to, it, there has to be an accountability for it. And the same thing here in the food supply chain and in the cold supply chain is let's make sure that every single process, every single owner in that, in that chain is doing the right thing. So I, I totally agree. So the right culture, obviously, that's a good one. So what would you say is the second key to success in a cold chain? I think once you have that culture in place, you have to develop a plan. And this is sort of the Food Safety Modernization Act in a nutshell. Have a process summary, have a written food safety plan. And, you know, I would have a, a written plan from your partners, too. I mean, if you're, if you're working with a carrier or a storage unit, get their safety plans as well. Identify the potential hazards and document every potential risk. Implement preventative control. These are all pieces of the Food Safety Modernization Act process, hazard control, and monitor and the plan really should be created with input from your extended team. So people like me, suppliers, carriers, your distribution center, and different experts. Because I might have a different perspective than the people that I deal with every day that are at some of these distribution centers. I say, hey, listen, you guys are doing this, you guys are doing this. It would be, be better for this product if you could do it this way. You know what I mean? Yep. Tyler, if I was right now, if I was in charge of, a, if I was head of logistics at a food company, Mm -hmm. I would want to partner with brokers and carriers that that understood and valued food safety as much as mm -hmm. I did. And and what's interesting to me about that is we've kind of still have this model in a lot of places, not everywhere, where I say, yeah, I am uh, I'm in charge of this food. And within my four walls, this food is like in a vault. Right. You mm -hmm. have key cards. We have monitors. Everything is perfect. And mm -hmm. then. When it needs to be transported, I call a broker and tell him, get me the cheapest reefer you can find, which might not have right. all, which might not have all the right. cool technologies like the trucks right. you were talking to, talking to me right. about or offline. So now I've got the cheapest truck. It could be old. It might not have all the sensing capability. And this guy who's driving the truck, the carrier who's driving the truck, what if they don't have the same thoughts on food safety that I do? I have a real problem with that. I, for, to me, it makes sense to say the top priority is not going to be the cheapest reefer. It's going to be, I picked a partner and I've met with them. I've had them to my facility. Mm -hmm. I visited their facility. I've seen their trucks. I like these guys. I picked them because they are compliant. They value food safety. And again, I think we need to change some of our thought process on transportation because I think we're off, we're a little off. Yeah, I, you know, I, you're right. And there's so many, you know, this is, and you understand this is, you know, from the brokerage side, there's so many, I'm on lists where they, a manufacturer or whatever would send out to a, a thousand brokers, pick the, pick the cheapest price. Yeah, I mean, if you're picking the cheapest price and you got to get, do you think that driver or that carrier really is going to care that much about that product as somebody who, who's reliable and that you're partnering with in a strategic way? You know, I mean, and it's like, if you're going to go get surgery, do you, are you going to pick you know, you might not pick the most outrageously expensive, but you're probably not going to pick the guy that is dirt cheap works out of his basement either. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so and it's, not, it's not worth it. And it's not worth the potential risk and the potential loss of bad food and, and bad business. You know, I mean, there's there's financial implications there, too. So it's not worth maybe saving one hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars to get the cheapest reefer when you're driving around with. $70,000 worth of product on there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I totally agree. So the first key you gave us, right culture. I totally agree with that one. Number two, develop a food safety plan. And that's not, uh, that's not even negotiable now. That is, uh, no. that's what, that's what's expected by the uh, F it, FDA. Yeah. Right. And I would say yeah. that you touched on one thing that I think is really key is get your extended team involved by getting your extended team involved. What you're doing is you're saying, this is important. I want you to be involved in my food safety plan because I want you to understand how much I care about this. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're working strategically with these, these kind of people, they become an extension of your business and they care about your product. You know I mean? So when I'm getting paid to, to move some trucks for a customer, 
a lot of times I'm interacting with my customer's customer more than they are sometimes. You know what I mean? Just scheduling and different things. And I'm, and I'm taking these calls at four o'clock in the morning. That's what the benefit of having a strategic partner is all about, is, is really having an extension of your own business. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, they become an extension of your supply yeah. chain. I love that term. And this does, we're kind of getting a little off track, but I think you can't have a transactional partner where you say, yeah, this is the first time I worked with, with Bubba's hauling. I hope they do a good job on food safety. Maybe they don't, yeah. maybe this is the first time they ever interacted with you and they don't understand what you need. And I, I, right. I struggle with that. So what's the third key to cold chain success? Uh, I think leveraging technology and embracing technology, especially today, ensure food safety and to, to comply with the FSMA. Companies should try to use technology and monitor temperature control and have the technology that goes with that. You know what I mean? And there's so, right now, there's so many companies that, that use it. And then the, so the ones that don't, you know, why don't you get on board with that? And there's, there's real-time monitoring and alerts for compliance. There's uh, sensors that, you know, they need to be calibrated and updated. And technology doesn't quit or call in sick. You know, there's no turnover in technology and it's constantly updated and it's constantly growing. So that's an important key. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that. So a few years back, and I'm, I'm not going to mention names, and you'll know why in a minute. I was talking to a company and they, they were a food company and they had their own transportation. And one of the things I heard a story that they told me was that there was food that went to a... Uh, it was needed to stay, I don't know if it's frozen or fresh, but it needed to stay within a temperature range. And the driver wasn't able to deliver on Friday, so he took it to the terminal and it was the truck was supposed to run all weekend to keep that food the right temperature. Well, somehow, some way it didn't get done. And so on Sunday night, when he came in to pick it up, he observes that the truck is out of temperature range. Well, it's mm-hmm. like to your point, it could be 70, 80, a hundred thousand dollars worth of food. Yeah. All he does. Does he turn himself in and say, I, I screwed up and we're going to have to pay this huge claim? Or does yeah. he just start up the truck, get it cooled down and deliver and hope for the best? And right. what I would say is I don't want to take that chance if it's my food. So I would want to say I have real time monitoring on that. People are going to make mistakes. We're going to, there's going to be turnover. People are going to be sick. All the, all the problems we, we have as humans. Technology doesn't call in sick to your point, but also we could see that in our data that something went wrong. We get some real-time alerts that tell us, hey, warning, Will Robinson, come get this truck back to temperature. Right. It's tracked and documented. So you understand exactly exactly what went wrong, where it went wrong. And a lot of times that can, you know, that can save us too. I mean, you know, we can we can find out where if our guy had his temperature correct the entire time and something wasn't right, where was the fault? Where did that happen? So you can track that back. And there's so many things right now that are changing. You know, blockchain is something that a lot of people are utilizing. And that especially is going to really help with that data management because there's, there's an encrypted, encrypted kind of chain of, of data that everybody has the same thing. You know, yep. so that's something that's being implemented and integrated into what we do. And, and I'll, one more thing about this is, you know, that it, there's all sorts of new artificial intelligence and different things. And, you know, what, what we like is, is the stuff that improves what's going on right now. I was down in Las Vegas at the big Las Vegas technology conference earlier this year, and it tr- sort of freaks me out. I mean, there's so much, you know, there's flying, you know, where it's in the Jetsons and there's, you know, there's already automated trucks that are being utilized. I have yet to book an automated truck, but, you know, I think that stuff's coming. So I think it's, it's something to embrace and fully use. going to help you out. Absolutely. So again, I totally agree. Number one, you told us was creating the right culture. Number two was developing a food safety plan. And again, that's required. And I think people are already doing that, but it's, there's a difference between having a a half-assed plan and having a world-class plan. So, and then the third key was let's leverage technology wherever we can. Uh, Totally agree with that. And now the fourth key to cold chain success is. This is where I come in, man. This is the transportation. (laughs) <laughs> this is getting it really. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is where a lot of this stuff can go wrong too. I, I see it every day. Having the appropriate temperature, having the appropriate communication, sanitation, monitoring. These are all things that are so important in a short one day runs. You know, if, if any of these things fall apart, you know, that's a big problem. So, you know, I utilize communication almost to the point of annoyance for truckers. And, you know, and, and I know the last thing truckers 
need you know, while they're driving or they want is to be bugged by a broker constantly. But you know, the ones that I use are the ones that understand how important this is. So if there's, if there's a trucker that, you know, for, if I'm booking a truck and they, they say, oh, we, you know, you can't call us, you, you can call the dispatch, you can't call your trucker, I, I can't use them, especially if it's refrigerated. Now, if they're moving um, hammers from point A to point B, I'm a little less stringent. But, you know, I need to see how, you know, I require the trucker to take a picture of how it is loaded into the truck because that's so important too. There's so many things can go wrong with the loading. And if it's loaded incorrectly and it falls apart and something opens up, you know, that's all, it's all waste. So I, I, there's, you know, about once a week, I have them reload, reload the truck. I uh, ask for a uh, documented seals, uh, you know, and when they send me the pictures, text me pictures of documented seals. And we're constantly asking them the temp because there's so much, so many times. And, I, and I've experienced in the past where maybe there was a miscommunication at the shipper. So they tell the driver, hey, actually, you should, you should run this at a certain temp. Well, the BOLs and, and the customer says you have to run it at this temp. You know, and so we need to we need to determine why, where the communication is and what it really needs to be at. So there's so many things along the line. Oh, yeah. And I would also say this when we're talking about transportation and the chain of custody. Mm-hmm. One of the things that always sticks in my mind is, again, when we think about a food warehouse or a food distributor mm-hmm. or maybe the manufacturer, they really they're very stringent in their own four walls. Mm-hmm. But, but when you start to move stuff to a dock, did we have the same care? Or the dock area. I mean, mm-hmm. ma- make sure that bugs can't get at it. Make sure that rodents, rats can't get at it. Make sure that somebody with um, bad intent can't get at it and tamper with it. Mm-hmm. Make sure that nothing can happen. And also, you know, it's it's very it's temperature controlled in my facility. And now I push it out to the dock, and I just push it out there a half an hour earlier. Well, this time of year in uh, most of the country, it's hot. So. I potentially right. take a risk that I've compromised my product on the dock and then I load it into a truck. And again, I need to make sure I'm working with somebody who values food safety and cold chain compliance to whatever the plan is as much as I do. So the, yeah. the big risks, big risk potentially if you're not doing the right things once it leaves your facility. And a lot of these guys are very good and, and there's a lot of real professionals out there and some of them are not so good. And I think about, you know, myself working on one, at one of these places at 17 years old, I probably wasn't really thinking about the Food Safety Modernization Act. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't all at, the top, at the top of my head. And so that's why all these checks and balances need to be put in place and constant communication, even to the point of annoyance. I mean, it's, that's how important it is. <laughs> Absolutely. So good one. So I like this. Number four we had is cold chain transportation that is mm-hmm. sanitary. And again, that's regardless of mode. We, most of the cold chain transportation is over the road, but it can also be going by ship or by uh, mm-hmm. air too. I know that's uh, that happens. So what's the last one? What's the fifth key to cold chain success? Well, this is something that we have sort of touched on and this should be integrated in everything, but it's really picking the right partners. Pick your partners that are FSMA compliant, and who value food safety as much as you're, you're in your company does. You built this culture, partner with people that are buying into this culture as well, because that's, there's so many hands that are involved in this. You really need to pick the people that are going to help you with your business and be an extension of this cold chain process, of your cold chain process, and understand your product and understand what you're doing. You know, there's, so many different, there's so many different variables for different products, produce, fresh chicken, frozen beef. And get somebody that understands you and understands your process. Yeah, I'm totally with you there, Tyler. And again, you use the term supply chain partners. I think that we are, there will always be transactional business or spot quotes, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. But I think we, especially when you're talking about food as valuable as it is and as, as important it is to our families, we need to pick partners. And I don't like the idea that the freight necessarily goes to the lowest bidder. We have to, maybe it's the lowest bidder who is compliant with what we're doing. So very important. Mm -hmm. I think, I think if you're, if you're asking for somebody to comply to every, all these things we've talked about here and have the latest and greatest trucks with the real time alerts and real time sensors, they can give us these real time alerts, then don't give it to the cheapest carrier. Get to the one who, again, who complies. So, and when I put on my sales hat, you know, that's part of my job is kind of, being a sales guy to, to a certain extent, you know, also working with the truckers and, and those kind of things and thinking about these, these different processes. But 
anytime I talk to somebody, I'm saying, Hey, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's a place I can add value to your business. And maybe we can have a discussion and they say, Oh yeah, you can, you want to, you want to one today? You want to lane today? That freaks me out a little bit. They didn't even ask, they didn't ask who I am. They didn't <laughs> right. ask what I specialize in. They didn't ask what, you know, so it's probably not somebody I want to work with anyway. I mean, that, you know, everybody has different ways that they, they operate, but there's too much liability involved. You know, I, I want to work with people that are interested in what we do and uh, appreciate the sort of relationship and the dedication and the research that we put into it. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's somebody for everyone in this market. But Mm -hmm, when I was selling transportation and logistics services, it used to be a red flag for me if somebody said, oh, oh, you got trucks? Well, uh, let's get all the paperwork in place. You can bid on today's lanes. And I was like, "Eh." yeah. And that that, that means I might I might win some today and I might lose them tomorrow. No, thanks. That's not what I'm looking for. (laughs) So. Tyler, this is this has been quite the education. I know it's a huge topic, and I appreciate mm-hmm. you sharing with us. So, I'm going to hit these in summary, and then maybe you have some closing remarks for us today. So, the first thing we talked about, the first key is, I think, dead on. It is creating the right culture. It's that continuous improvement, minimizing risk, being completely compliant to the Food Safety Modernization Act. Again, valuing food, and it's got to start at the top. That creating that culture. If the boss doesn't care, nobody cares. Second one, you talked about developing a food safety plan. If you're a food shipper, you're a food maker, that's what you're doing right now. But I think it's important that you don't just have a plan so you can check the box. You have a plan that you really put your heart and soul into because it's important. Number three, you talked about leveraging technology because technology doesn't call in sick and it doesn't ever cheat when it makes a mistake. Um, (laughs) It's got to be calibrated though. You got to be updated Mm -hmm. because it's not not flawless. So fourth key you said was, you know, cold chain transportation that's sanitary. You want to pick that trucking company that again values food safety just as much as you do. And last but not least, it's something very similar is uh, pick the right cold chain partners because they will hopefully do the first four things that we talked about. So right. any closing thoughts on this, Tyler? I think you pretty much summed it up. I, I think, you know, every, every process is different, but there really, there's no room for shortcuts. There's no one answer. So I think you have to do your work. You have to value food safety because this is the business you're in. And I think it's, it's a process and it's an important, important one for sure. Yep, absolutely. So Tyler, before we get offline here, tell us a little bit about what's going on over at Reliable. Well, like I said, we're an asset-based third-party logistics provider with also a full-service brokerage. And, uh, you know, we're we're a mid-sized company, but we are big enough that we have an infrastructure to scale to anyone's needs. And we work with some, some of the major corporations in the United States, but we're small enough that we are really focused on account management and customer service. Like, so, so when you're working with me, you know, I'm going to talk to you initially, I'm going to book the truck. I'm going to talk to the, you know, me and my team are going to talk to the truck all the way through the process. We have 24 hour, you know, operations, obviously, but I'm taking calls before. I just took a call at uh, two in the morning last night. You know, there was a low bridge. The guy couldn't get around. You know what I mean? So I had to look on the GPS and, and figure out a different, you know, so, you know, that, we're, we're doing that constantly, but we're also, we're small enough that we are nimble and can shift with the evolving industry. And so we have a team of, you know, I get there very early, Joe, but our, we have a team of technology wizards that get there even earlier. I've never gotten there before these guys, and they are constantly making incredible technology, which I think is so, so important in this industry. And it's really going to drive everything that we do in the future. So do you specialize in any, in any sector? Oh, yeah. Most of our assets, the majority of our assets are reefers. So we really focus on food transportation and that I, I would consider that our, our main specialty. Well, excellent, Tyler. Thanks again so much for sharing. This has been, uh, again, quite an education. And uh, is, <laughs> I know it's a huge topic, but you did a good job at summarizing oh, uh, some of the keys to cold chain success. And we appreciate it. So until next time, thank you all so much for listening to my podcast. Thank you, Tyler, for being on my podcast. And thank you. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com.